So my name is Jonah Brooker Cohen. I'm currently assistant professor of digital media at Lehman College, which is part of CUNY, the CUNY campuses in New York. And I've been working in the field of kind of media arts related projects um, having to do with networks um, over the past 10 or so years. And I'll talk a bit about those projects as well as some of the workshops that I've been doing um, since 2003. So the title of my talk is called Disruption, Hacking, and Networks. So I do a lot of all three of these things <laughs> connected. And I'm going to show you some examples of that and, and just sort of over the, over the years of what going on. So disruptive context. So this is an internet cafe that I probably would not go into, I don't think, right? Internet cafe virus. Uh, this was in Madrid, Spain, um, you know, kind of funny name. But I mean, these are the kind of contexts I like. Things that kind of don't make sense, but are also kind of on the verge of collapse, <laughs> in a way. Um, and this is a quote by Michael Lewis who wrote Next, The Future Just Happened. And he says, it's widely disruptive to speed up information. And, that, and speeding up information was not the only thing the internet had done. The internet had made it possible for people to thwart all sorts of rules and conventions. It wasn't just the commercial order that was in flux. Many forms of authority were secured by locks waiting to be picked. And those are the kind of areas that I'm interested in. And how do we change conventions of the internet? How do we how do we model projects or create projects that really disrupt, subvert, and challenge the way that we're used to thinking about things? There's another internet cafe that I would go to probably. It's pretty <laughs> nice. Uh, <laughs> but um, overall, I'll kind of take you through what I'm going to talk about. Um, the first is looking at subversion and consequence. So what happens when you add something like a physical consequence to the simple act of visiting a website? Right? We visit thousands of websites all the time, but we don't actually think of how those, that, those visits could affect something the same way, for instance, when you open a door, you have a chance of breaking the handle off if you're the million, million person who's touched that handle. right? But on a website, you could be the billionth visitor and never make a, a dent in the website. Also interested in information reviz, so revisualization. So taking things that are on the screen, tangibility, so stuff that Ben does, but turning it into physical forms instead of just on the screen. So how do we actually, um, how can we manipulate data like that? Also interested in, I'll talk a bit about this, so looking at social media and visualizing things like Twitter and Facebook <coughs> to measure things that are not very technological, such as reality TV, right, which is something that television is an old technology. How do we use new technology to inform us a bit about old technology? And then finally, as JD was mentioned, um, over the past 12 years, I've been running a workshop called Scrapyard Challenge, where we take old junk technology, things that people toss away on the street, and we make new interfaces, and we make sound interfaces, and we do workshops. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. Those have been running around the world since uh, 2003. So starting off about digital space, this is a picture of the telegraph, right, invented in 1832 by Samuel Morse. And so <laughs> thinking about this technology, right, this was the thing that actually made us connect, you know, across the ocean to other people and other continents. And it looks really archaic now, right? It's like this big metal handle thing. <laughs> um, but this quote by Neil Postman, who started a program at NYU that I used to teach at um, from his book Technopoly really puts into perspective. He says, the telegraph removes space as an inevitable constraint on the movement of information. And for the first time, transportation and communication were disengaged from each other. Right? So that's kind of the experience we get when we click on a link. We are immediately transported. So in my work, I'm really interested in how do we reintroduce the journey back into online communication systems. So you guys all had a journey to get here, and that was part of your life experience. But on the web, there is no journey, right? You just click and you're there. So how do we actually bring that back? So it brings me to one of my early projects, which is called looking at download speed, and it's called Crank the Web. And it's actually this hand crank that I made that you actually connect to a browser, and you actually have to manually download the web. Right? So physically <laughs> download it. <laughs> so what Crank the Web did was it materializes an invisible thing like bandwidth, right? It turns it into something we actually have to work for. Imagine this at your gym, you're kind of biking away. Um, <laughs> it emphasizes physical interaction in an automated world, right? Everything we do now is automated. So how do we bring physical interaction back to it? And it takes a 3,000-year-old technology like the crank and connects it up to something current, right, which is the internet. And so how do we actually take these old forms of technology, mix them with new forms, and make new output? This is what it sounded like in the cranking. Probably don't want to do this every morning, checking your email, right? <laughs> so it's loud and, and obnoxious and all these things. But you know, to me, that, that actually really humanizes things. And it brings me to another project of mine that looks at presence in the same kind of way. Um, this is a project that is currently installed in Canada, actually, at the Museum of Contemporary Canadian Art um, in Toronto. But basically, it's a project of mine called Alerting Infrastructure, and it's this big jackhammer that connects to the side of the building. And every time the website associated with that building gets a hit, this thing starts actually destroying <laughs> the building. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Alerting Infrastructure really examines how a website relates to the physical space it represents. Like, we have visitors here to the NAS website right now, but we're not actually connecting to them. So how can we make those connections 
feel you know more tangible, just kind of more in your face. Um, an example of how these visitors react in you know online and offline spaces, and then it adds consequences to visiting websites. We don't necessarily think we're going to do anything when we visit a website. In this case, you're actually tearing down the building that you're uh, <laughs> visiting, so it's doing something. Um, I have a short video of this project. So this is an old project, 2003. Um, it's been updated and changed and whatever, um, and installed it probably about 10 different countries at this point. It's one of, one of my most popular. People like destruction, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you can sort of get the sense of what it's doing. It's kind of loud, too loud. So this jackhammer car is hammering the space. And on the web, you get a readout like this. <laughs> so thanks for visiting. You just destroyed our building. Um, but, <laughs> but you know, that's the kind of feedback you get. So you actually get a sense that you did something to the building. So <clears throat> it's really trying to amplify this concern that we don't need physical spaces anymore. We can have a web presence. We don't need like these big structures anymore. So how do we actually um, you know, change that dynamic of thinking? Cool. So that's that project. <laughs> this is my next version. I haven't made it yet. But if you guys uh, know a building you want to destroy, let me know. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so moving on from there, I'm really interested in disruption. This is a funny picture I found of the keyboard you know, a keyboard according to Microsoft, creator unknown, I'm not sure who made it, but you know, like if you ever in a Windows machine, you probably enter that key combination too many times. Um, Donald Norman, who wrote The Invisible Computer, writes, once an infrastructure gets established, it's really hard to change. They're deeply embedded in the culture of society, so ingrained in the ways they've learned to live, work, play, and change, that you know, changing these can take decades. And it's true, things take forever to change. Um, here we are in DC where the government doesn't change very much. <laughs> um, so, so basically, I was looking at this question, I was thinking about social networks. And at the time, Facebook and all these networks didn't exist, and I was working with email lists primarily. And I wanted to change the way email lists existed. So I created this project. It was originally as a commission in, uh, for the Whitney Museum in New York. It's called Bump List, and it's an email community for the determined. So it's an email list, like every list you've been on, but it only supports six people. And when you join it, you bump somebody off the list. <laughs> so to be part of this, you got to keep joining, and you bumping and joining. So it becomes this kind of musical chairs meets email. And it places rules on forms of discourse, which really changes the dynamic. Um, there was a woman who was on it so much, she was fired from work because she kept subscribing all the time. Um, we had people competing. We didn't actually have an archive, so you couldn't see what you missed. You could only see how many times you bumped, how many times you resubscribed, and your hall of fame for how long you managed to stay on it somehow. Um, <laughs> and it forces exclusivity and competition to change modes of communication, right? It was about people really challenging these forms of these existing systems and trying to like, you know, actually break them, change them, use them the best they could. This is a screenshot of what the front page looked like. We only showed you what the most recent messages were. So it obviously had no archive. You could just see subject headings. And you see at the time, I think it was just mentioned in the New York Times, so it had 82,000 total subscriptions. Uh, 77,000 brave souls kept resubscribing, I'm not sure. But, um, but basically, you know, it was a really kind of interesting social change and social dynamic just by changing a simple rule, subscription rule. So you imagine if you do that today to social networks, you could really get some interesting output. So adding physicality to online communication is all I'm about. And I built this project last year that looks at kind of why, how email, the past emails take. And it's basically a project that exists as a plugin for a mail client that shows you when you get your mail how many miles your mail went, right? Because we send, we send regular mail and it gets damaged and you have all these old envelopes and stuff, but we don't see that with email. So what email miles does, it's a hardware odometer, free plugin for mail, <laughs> that prints the miles, countries, and continents your email comes through. So I got an email from a friend that says this email's traveled through four continents, this many miles, uh, you know, this many, <laughs> this many nations, things like that. And it really introduces the idea of proximity and physical location to digital communication, such as email, things that we kind of very much lose with email. And it reminds us of our spatial distance from each other geographically, which is something that email totally takes away because it's so instantaneous. <clears throat> so that's an interesting way of kind of thinking about, you know, sort of social media in the old sense. And now we think about social media in the new sense and things like Twitter. This is an amazing quote that I found about Twitter. The best way to engage honestly with the marketplace would be Twitter, so never use the words engage honestly in marketplace, um, because it is kind of crazy. So we did a project, um, another project for the Whitney in 2012 that looks at disrupting social media, and it's called America's Got No Talent, <laughs> that show. And basically, it looks like this. It's an American flag kind of visualization. 
where um, it ranks tweets about the shows as kind of a horizontal bar graph on the lines of this flag. And then the, um, the star section um, finds tweets on Twitter that have the words America or no talent. And then it mashes them up together and then retweets them out. So it creates, creates something called a tweet back loop, which we kind of coined. This was a commission I did with uh, Catherine Moriwaki for the Whitney. <laughs> and it's a visualization that really challenges how these shows are rated by their mentions in Twitter feeds, not you know Nielsen ratings. And it retweets the, the mashups um, <laughs> finally there. So I'll talk quickly about two more things. Oops. Um, two more projects relating to data viz. This was a physical data viz project that I did that looks at kind of terrorism. And it's called Police State. And basically what it does is it scans networks for suspicious keywords that are found on like an FBI watch list. And if it finds those keywords in a network, it'll then send a command to these little miniature police cars which drive around. They're like 20 police cars. And they all drive around in patterns based on keywords that are found on the network. So it's looking at data viz as well, but reappropriation into physical space. And it represents this information in, you know, in a real space. And it's sort of, the idea is to strengthen the relationship between data and its physical embodiment. I have a video for this, but I don't have time. So you guys can check it out on my site. And then finally, I wanted to talk about the workshops that I've been doing called Scrapyard Challenge. And scrapyardchallenge.com has a lot more info about it. But since 2003, we've been running these workshops all over the world. And they're about hacking up obsolescence. So taking, taking junk, taking electronics, taking um, you know, old objects, and turning them into new interfaces. And it was developed with Catherine in 2003. And it teaches interaction design and hacking with no skills. So you actually don't have to know anything to be part of the workshop. It's really interesting. We just like basically tear things apart to reimagine how they could, could function. And we've held them 66 times in 14 countries on five continents. Here's a little map of some of the. Some of the locations that's in the US. Um, <coughs> I've done a lot of them in, in Europe. And that, this is the website, so you can take a look at it. It's scrapyardchallenge.com. There's a bunch of them in Europe and things like that. <coughs> but these, really, these workshops are really about sort of discovery through um, you know, uh, taking obsolete objects and trying to rethink about how they could actually exist. I don't have time to show the videos I want. But anyway, so finally, just to wrap up, Disruption and Network's a Guide. Right. So this is a Facebook vending machine. I think it's really funny. Can I buy a friend? Or something? I, don't, I don't have any. I don't have any friends. I gotta buy one. Um, so <laughs> somebody. This isn't my project, but I think it's just hilarious. Um, looking at so how would you do this? You subvert network ubiquity. So you deconstruct network associations to provoke new relationships. Right. You take apart these ways we think about networks, and you provoke new ways of thinking about them. Um, you take away the context of interaction and you replace it with different contexts in order to challenge how those experiences exist. <clears throat> and this is something that a lot of these projects do, but other, you know, other projects of mine do as well. Um, misdirect metaphors, amplify metaphors to disrupt conventions, especially online. We have so many metaphors, the search engine, right? That's a metaphor. Um, how do we actually misdirect those, challenge those to make them seem a bit um, you know, kind of silly, but also just you know, make people think a bit differently. And then finally, challenge constraints, disrupt the rules of hardware and network engagement, void your warranty, as Make, say, Make Magazine always says, right? <laughs> um, try to kind of you know, misdirect them into a new way of thinking in general. So th that's kind of my final guide. And then just wanted to thank you guys again. And I'll do questions after. Right? Yeah. And I have a lot more projects of mine. Thanks. Sir at coinoperated.com and then the workshop info and some videos on Scrapyard. Thank you.